Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 147. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey. You already knew that. However, what you don't know is what we're going to talk about today. I think you have an idea, though. We're going to obviously be talking a whole lot about cash flow, but specifically, we're going to talk about how you can make it happen. And yes, we're going to talk about doing it with real estate, which is awesome. As you guys know, that's one of the things that I love to do, and it's always awesome to meet other individuals who are doing the same thing in various different ways. And today's guest is no exception to that. One of the things that I think you will get from this particular episode is understanding things like the value of discipline, respect, hard work, and most importantly, and this is the hard one, delayed gratification, because those are the very things that today's guest, Angelo Ramora, has been able to do. Now, We're going to dig into his background, how he got here, and most importantly, what I know you guys want to know is how do you build a portfolio worth millions of dollars in the middle of Ohio and do well over 300 real estate transactions and run three businesses at the same time? That's one of the things that I want to know, and I know you want to know as well, because today's guest has done those very things. So let's welcome Angelo Ramore. Angelo, you there? Jay, how are you, mate? Thanks for having me. I am excited that you are here. You are quite welcome. And I have a feeling that everybody's going to want you to do most of the talking because you got that accent. (laughs) Mate, I don't even want to tell you the stuff that I get whispered in my ears. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Six E's. It started already. Started already. (laughs) Now, um, many people know already the first question I'm about to ask you, and I've got to ask, but I'm asking a lot because it's interesting to me what you used to do and where, where, how you grew up, et cetera. And I think that's going to help a ton of people understand what it actually takes to make it get, uh, to make it happen at the end of the day. So I, I often look at today's entrepreneurs as like, you know, yesterday's superheroes. Now, I, I don't know of any superheroes in Australia, but I'm assuming they've got them. I have no idea. But when I think about a superhero, he or she, they go around, they save people, usually from their own mess, but they save people, change their lives, etc. And I think that's exactly what entrepreneurs do. However, before they put on the cape or the mask or the lasso or the ropes or whatever it is that they use, before they did that, they were a normal person in some way, shape, or form. They had a transformation, and then they became super. What we want to know is, before you were out there, you know, running your construction and venture capital, before you were doing three businesses and the millions of dollars of portfolio and real estate and hundreds of transactions, who is Angelo Ramora? Well, mate, great question and an awesome intro. And mate, look, I will always be a blue collar working class guy. And no matter what happens in the future, I will always consider myself a blue collar working class guy. And mate, wow, crazy story. What a journey. Um, You know, I was once told that the journey is much better than the destination. I can tell you what, it sure has been fun, mate, over these last couple of years. But um, yeah, mate, look, I guess my story starts um back home in Australia. You know, I quit school when I was 14. Um, I became a professional soccer player when I was 18, and unfortunately, things did not work out there, and I kind of had to, um, you know, uh, find a way to make a living, and, you know, not having any education whatsoever, the only thing that I could find was, you know, working as a laborer in dirty construction sites, and as I was working, you know, slaving away, um, I got given a book, 
Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I mean, this is a book that, um, you know, many people, it's changed their life and it changed my life too, Jay. And, and that just kind of completely brainwashed me. It started, you know, it got me thinking about assets versus liabilities and business and finance and stocks and real estate and whatnot. And, you know, I kept slaving away, but I kept educating myself on anything and, and, and everything business and finance related. And kind of one thing led to another, you know, I was managed to establish a relationship at the time with a, with a real estate agent in Australia. I kind of became his apprentice and, you know, he taught me a lot that I know today about, you know, buying, uh, working with clients, negotiating and just how real estate works in general. And, um, you know, once again, one thing led to another, a few years went past, I was still working hard, still developing myself, catching up with a lot of people who are where I wanted to be. This is a very key thing, Jade, you've got to talk to people who are where you want to be. Because then they will pull you along on their journey and you'll achieve, you know, a certain success. Um, and, you know, combine the two, mate. I combined my experience of working as a laborer in construction sites, okay, and the knowledge that I had about construction and rehabs. And now, recently, working as a real estate apprentice, real estate agent's apprentice, where I was buying and negotiating, and I put the two together. And that just kind of led me to flipping homes, buying rundown distressed properties, fixing them up and, you know, either buy and hold or buy, hold and, and, and sell. So there you go, mate. Here I am. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Now, it, it, here's here's an interesting question, I think, uh, for some, because you, you and I share a, a lot in common from the educational side. Me not, you know, I finished, I did finish high school. That was about it. Uh, and I, I went to college, decided that that was not a place I needed to be. Yep. And, and, and that was like the, the end. But after that, it was all about trying to figure it out through hard work and, and determination. Let me ask you this. From your standpoint or viewpoint today, how important is the 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 street knowledge, the actual experience of going out there to figure out how to do things as opposed to learning it strictly from a classroom, in your opinion? Jay, it's the most important thing ever. There's a saying by Jim Ron, okay? Formal education will earn you a living while personal development will give you a lifestyle. Mate, everything that I know today, I learned by asking questions of people who are where I wanted to be. That's the first thing. And the second thing is I actually made a decision, took action, and failed. I mean, I failed so many freaking times, it's not funny. But guess what, mate? If I have to put my head through that wall to eventually get a result, I will do that. And at the end of the day, that's what it takes, mate. You need to take action. You First of all, you need to make a decision. You need to take action. And then every single time you get knocked down, you just pick yourself up and you keep moving forward. Okay? It doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you keep moving forward. You, you, many ex- you'll gain many experiences. Then your perceptions will change from the failures. And then you just reassess. After every failure, you reassess and you move in a, in a different direction until you get the desired result. Mate, street, street smarts is, in my opinion, and I'm not just being biased here because I've got no formal education whatsoever, but I genuinely believe that street smarts is, is the way to go. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm not going to disagree with you, but one of the <laughs> things that I, I absolutely love about what you said was, it doesn't matter how slow you go. And at the end of the day, is you're still moving forward. You're still making forward progress. I often tell people to fail fast, fail forward, and fail frequently. However, what gives you the courage to be willing to fail? Because so many people run the other direction. Well, mate, great question. Guess what? The purpose in life, your purpose in life. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a saying, right? The two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you found out why. I speak to so many people on a daily basis and, and you know, I kind of feel that they don't know why they get out of bed every morning. They don't know why they go to work. They don't know why they live life. Well, mate, you know, I don't want to be rude, but what a BS life. I mean, why the hell do you do what you do? Now, I know that a lot of people can't find that purpose and it takes time to find it, but keep searching. Keep searching until you find it. And then that purpose, for instance, my purpose is bigger than myself, mate. I do right. what I do every single day, not for myself. I do it for my loved ones. I do it for my family. I do it for my friends. I want to see the smile on their faces if I can give them something that I could never have one day. You know what I mean? And and, and that's what kind of drives me. And, and when the purpose is bigger than yourself and it's bigger than money, okay, that green piece of paper, then there is no fear. There is no pain. There is no hunger. 
I mean, you can just keep going, Matt. You can just keep rolling with the punches and you can just keep getting up and keep moving forward. So find your purpose, guys. You have to find your purpose. Well, okay. So let's take let's take that angle for a second. I mean, you originally, it seems as though you thought your purpose might have been in, in sports, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, however, as you said, that did, that was not the case. So tell us a little bit about how, say, someone right now, they're thinking, you know, because we all think, hey, this is the area I'm supposed to go. What was it that told you that this area was actually not where you should be and you needed to be somewhere else? Mate, great question. You're really, um, you're really um, giving me some good questions here. Look, I can't give you an answer. There's no magic pill and there's really no formula when it comes to that. It's just a feeling that you feel from within once you know you're doing something right. I guess that's the best way to explain it. You know what I mean? It just feels right. You, 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 you can wake up with a smile on your face every single morning. You love what you do. For instance, I love helping people. I love working with people. And, and it's, just a, it's just a passion of mine, okay? Unfortunately, things didn't work out with soccer. And that was a huge passion of mine, Jay. I was playing soccer since the age of five. I was training twice a day. I mean, I quit school because of the bloody game, mate. I mean, that's <laughs> volume, okay? That's how passionate right. and extreme I was about the game. And, and unfortunately, as I said, things did not work out. And I was kind of on a soul searching uh, uh, time there of two or three years where I didn't know where I wanted to go and I didn't know what I wanted to do. But with that, with that being said, mate, I kept searching. I kept attending seminars. I kept reading books. I kept networking with people. And I was trying to find myself. I was trying to find who I am, where I want to be, what do I want to do? And, you know, unfortunately, I, I did have a bit of tragedy happen around a year ago in, in my family and business and whatnot. Um, but, you know, that was that kind of just, you know, led me to where I am today. And, and, and um, you know, I found my why, I found my purpose, and I love what I do. And, um, you know, I'm excited about what the future brings, mate. Now, and, and those are the things that I, I think I want people to hear, because oftentimes when we wake up or when we're starting to build a business or anything for that matter, we think, okay, this is it, and it's going to go in a straight line. <laughs> you know, wow, <laughs> <laughs> Here, it's straight line to the end goal. That's all we're going to get. But yet, there are, it's fraught with so many twists and turns that we're usually not expecting, and dare I say, often unprepared to you know receive, let alone interpret what we're supposed to do with them. So, in, in that in that space where you're wondering, you know, hey, you, 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 we'll call it limbo for lack of a better way of putting it. I often believe, and I think very, very strongly that what we used to do or what we are, our skill sets from a prior industry have a lot to do with what we're doing today. And I'm just curious in hindsight now, having gone through the professional soccer, having gone through, you know, construction sites, having gone through all of those things, what did you learn there that now serves you as you go out there to create, you know, your, your housing empire? Awesome, mate. Well, look, I guess the, the, the most important things that I learned from my soccer playing ga- days are, are discipline, okay? The discipline to get out of bed every single morning, okay, put on my clothes, you know, catch a tram for 45 minutes in, in, the, in the cold of, of, of Europe back then um, and, um, you know, show up to training and then run a grueling 10 to 15 miles in the early hours of the morning and pushing through that pain barrier. Okay, pushing through the pain barrier. It wasn't easy, mate. It was very hard. And, and anyone that's been, uh, you know, uh, active in sport, they will know when, when you get tired, you want to stop. Your mind starts telling you, you got to stop now because you're tired. And, and it's, it's pushing through your mind telling you, you have to stop. You have to slow down. That actually gets you out of your comfort zone. And that's where the magic happens, mate. When you're in the gym, right? And you do those, you do those, you, you do 10 reps. Well, you don't gain any muscle then. You gain muscle when you hardly push out those last five reps. Okay. Same as in business. And that's probably the most important thing that I learned there. And then, you know, as you mentioned earlier on, earlier on in the intro, delayed gratification, those 10, 15 miles that you run today and that you run tomorrow and that you run the day after and that you run two weeks after, well, guess what, mate? They might not come to fruition until the last day of the last game of the season where it's the 90th minute and you score that winning goal, okay? And that is, my friend, delayed gratification. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And now for, for those of us who might not understand soccer, can you tell us why that 90th minute is so important? Sure, mate. Well, you guys, you guys play that American football, that egg shaped ball game. Yeah, here, right? exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Jay, the 90th minute is pretty much the last minute of the game. All righty. There's yeah. in soccer, you've got two halves. You've got a 45 minute half, which is first half, and another 45 minute half, which is the second half. 
So the 90th minute would kind of be classified as the game's about to end. The score is 0-0, so no teams have scored. And then you get the ball and you're going one-on-one with the keeper like you would in hockey. And then, you know what I mean? You've got to put it in the back of the net to win the championship or to win the game. Exactly. And I think what you're really speaking to is, I mean, many people have said things like, you know, success is where opportunity plus preparation actually meet. And there's there are things that you must do to be prepared to win, obviously in sport, but definitely in business. And like the the concept of your mind telling you that it's time to stop pushing through, I, I think is very, very true in business as well. But yet many of us who may not have taken on a, you know, a sport or anything to that level might not be prepared for that. So if you were talking to someone who was trying to, to, to build something for the first time or, or, or someone who's currently building something and maybe they're beginning to experience some, we'll call them challenges as they go out there, how do they, how do, where do they tap into to be able to get their, their, their actions in line with what it is that they want to achieve when their mind is, for lack of a better way of sure. putting it, playing tricks on them. Mate, you're really pulling some good questions on me. Well done. Um, <laughs> mate, look, you make your own luck. Just keep hustling. Don't take anything for granted. Do not ever get too euphoric when times are good and do not get depressed when times are bad, okay? I'll repeat that. Do not get euphoric when times are good and do not get depressed when times are bad. Always try and keep a level head, okay? Uh, Don't react. Always respond. Keep hustling. There's always another door that will open. Tomorrow's a new day. Never, ever, ever give up. Remember, we said it earlier. Always keep moving forward. It doesn't matter how slow it is. I'm I'm full of quotes today for you, mate. If you can't run, (laughs) walk. If you can't walk, crawl but just keep moving forward no matter what you do you always have to keep moving forward guys indeed indeed now talk to me a little bit because i I think i understand exactly where you're coming from but i want to hear it from your perspective when you say don't react but respond i i I totally resonate with that because that one of the things i've been saying to the team and myself recently is keep calm and work the problem keep calm and work the problem whatever it is that's going on keep calm and work the problem because it's often not so bad that bad things happen it's how we react and hopefully not make them worse of course i would love to know the difference that you're the the distinction that you're making between reacting versus responding Sure. Well, mate, a reaction would be when you when something doesn't go your way and you throw up your hands in the air and you get out of your chair and you start punching the wall with your fist, okay? What have you achieved by doing that? P- potentially breaking your hand. Everyone in the office has, has seen how pissed off you are and how infuriated you are. And guess what? You have just raised uh, 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 you've just pissed off everyone in the office and you literally have achieved nothing okay you've achieved nothing everyone's wound up no one's happy and the problem is still there the problem is still present so what i mean by that is do not react don't let yourself react calm down try and bite your tongue uh, control yourself for a second and respond okay take action make a decision and take action in fixing the problem in a calm and collected way and that's when something arises you acknowledge what has happened, and then you can calmly tap your team member on the shoulder and say, hey, guys, check this out. We need to rectify this as soon as possible because it's going to cause this, this, and this down the track. So that's what I would kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, if I could um, uh, give you an explanation of what don't react, always respond would mean. Excellent. Right? Excellent. Now, as you're going through this journey, so you're going through your professional soccer, you did the construction thing. At some point, you know, even when you're working with the the real estate agent, at some point you decide, hey, I might be able to do this on my own in some way, shape, or form. I might be able to to make my own business of this thing. Tell us about how that transformation, where those thoughts and that inspiration to do that came from. Sure, mate. Well, look, I was thinking to myself one day, okay, so I'm working for someone else right now and I'm just making that other person richer. They're micromanaging me. They're not letting me be free and I've got a free soul and free spirit and I'm very entrepreneurial minded and whatnot. And I thought to myself, if I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, I'm limited. Jay, I'm limited to how much money I can make. And then when I thought to myself, okay, well, if I start a business, 
I'm not limited. I can buy one house and make a 10K profit, or I can buy a thousand houses and make a 10K profit. There is no limit to what you can do. The only limit is you, okay? And that's when I kind of started grasping the fact of that I shouldn't be working for someone else, that I should be working for myself and, and pushing myself as much as I can to do the best I possibly can. And, um, you know, that kind of led me down the path of wanting to start my own business. And I failed, right? I failed. Um, and I started another one and I failed again and, and, you know, I started another one and, and, you know, here we are today. And I like, I like, uh, I read somewhere, mate, where it says out of 10 businesses, you know, only one will succeed and nine will fail. Well, guess what I say to that? Well, that's just great. Well, then you just have to start 10 businesses and you'll be a success. <laughs> <laughs> you have a guaranteed ratio right there. Exactly. You, you're almost there. If you're at number seven, three more to go. There you go, so, mate. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I like it. So for most people though, they have that same thought. They have the thought of, hey, uh, you know, it, it would make it makes more logical sense for me to apply my skills and abilities in in something that I own and control and call my own business, etc. Yet they still don't do it. And I think it's because they, they don't develop the courage to go out there and still strike out and make it happen. Where did you get the courage to go after that thought to actually put action behind it and turn yeah. that dream into something that's tangible. Well, mate, we, we have, I have to take you back to the why. Okay. You have to find out why you live every day. Okay. Why do you get up out of the, why do you get out of bed every morning? Why do you do what you do? You have to find yourself in an industry. You have to find yourself in, in, in a, in something that you like doing. Okay. Because if you don't like your job or if you don't like your business, well, it's not going to last because you're never going to be able to push through that, that pain barrier. So you have to like what you do. And then of course, when you find out your purpose, mate, as I mentioned earlier, you feel no pain, you feel no fear, you feel no hunger, just the sheer drive and determination to succeed for whatever your bigger purpose is. Um, so, um, yeah, mate, that's a pretty much the short version for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the thing is, is I, I, I got to ask the question because they keep, I know they want to hear you talk. They don't, they're like, Ooh, I love that accent. Now with that being the case though, here's, here's the thing. At some point, because I, I think, you know, uh, entrepreneurs take on extra responsibility. And indeed, we're rewarded for taking extra responsibility. You, we, we actually say, I'm going to take responsibility. In our case, when we provide real estate, we're saying, I'm going to provide jobs and housing for other people, mm -hmm. period. That's what we're going to do. And there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And what would you say were some of the challenges you experienced first and put taking on that responsibility for other people so that they can be prepared like hey don't do this because i did this and that did not work out so well sure. but etc are you tired of letting good cash flow generating ideas go to waste go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready to apply for a complimentary yes that means free one-on-one -on -one breakthrough session Take action now. Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Before we get back to today's episode of the Cashflow Diary podcast, your host, Jay Massey, has some important insights to share with you. All right, guys, here's some good news for you. You don't need an accent to do real estate. I know you've been listening to this particular episode and thinking that was his secret sauce and advantage, but no, that's not the case. There's so many things as you are learning that transfer from continent to continent simply because it's real estate. It's one of those essential skills, if you will, that all you need is the legal right to own property and, well, obviously the ability to sell stuff in a very serious way. So, Hopefully you're getting a lot out of this particular understanding. And remember this always, the cavalry isn't coming. Start where you are. And once you start, stay started. Enough of me. Let's get back to it. Well, Jay, look, my, sport, my story is quite unique because I was initially investing in Australia, building my personal portfolio, and I was buying these super expensive properties like a lot of the folks here on the East Coast and West Coast were and buying them high, hoping, hoping to sell them even higher. So I lost a ton of money there, and I quickly figured out that that wasn't a sustainable way of moving forward, right? Then I moved here to the US because the cash flow opportunities here are just so stupidly awesome, right? Especially here in the Midwest. I mean, I feel like a kid in a candy store, mate. But I guess if I could tell 
what, if anyone takes anything from this interview uh, with you and me, this is the most important thing that I think that everyone needs to consider, okay? And they need to not focus on the stats and the demographics of a particular area. Forget about that. Do not focus on that. You have to. You have to surround yourself with people that are, number one, loyal, number two, honest, number three, not greedy, and number four, respectful, okay? Loyalty, honesty, no greed, respect. These people that you surround yourself with have to have your best interest at heart, and guess what, mate? I love being the dumbest person in the room. I honestly do, because all of these folks, right, they can do the things that I can't or that I don't want to do. So focus on the people first before you start looking at the stats and demographics of a particular area, and then you will do good. Because every single time, Jay, that I lost money, guess what, mate? It wasn't because the deal was bad or because the area was declining or because of the population growth or whatever. It was because I got screwed over by someone. They cheated me or they lied to me or they were dishonest or they were not loyal. So it's always the people that cause you financial problems and headaches and the loss of money. Never the stats and demographics of a particular area. So focus on the people first before anything else. No matter what you're doing, Jay, if you're buying one property, if you're building a business, if you're bloody getting married, it's always <laughs> down to that individual or the group of people that you're working with. You know, um, if this was like, you know, a concert right now, this would be one of those moments where you <laughs> could just drop the microphone and walk <laughs> off stage. Because it that I wish I oh, if you were listening. Before you listen further, go back, rewind, listen to everything he just said, because it is exactly like that. So many times, especially as real estate investors, we get hung up on all of those little data facts and whatnot. But you and I em- enjoy something that's the same. It's like, I-, I love being the dumbest person. In fact, when I'm not the dumbest person in the room, that's when I get scared. I'm like, <laughs> no, we have a problem here. I should not know more. And that that becomes a whole different host of problems in and of itself. So there's something that... Uh, you 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 brought up you know starting in in Australia with the real estate and it being expensive and yeah I know that you guys or at least Australians are still going through uh, some kind of crazy price issues out there and I don't even understand it but hey it's awesome it, I guess it happens from time to time one of the things that that I would love to hear is that I, I hear that you're known for buying Australia's cheapest house oh well wow, mate taking me back yes <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the case here, Jay. But um, back home, I mean, look. Let me give you an example. The average median house price in Sydney right now is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, okay, got it. Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that is just absolutely stupid. It is not sustainable. Why the <laughs> hell would you want to be getting into so much debt? And guess what, mate? The rent does not even cover your repayments. So you're, you're, you're losing money. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Mm. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, guess what, mate? People are doing that every day, all day long. And that's one of the main reasons why I think the US economy tanked. And there was a lot of folks that were getting greedy. They were buying high, wanting to sell even higher. And they, and you know, look where we are today. You know, we can buy properties here in the Midwest for, you know, 20 cents on the dollar. Anyway, mate, Australia's cheapest house. Australia's cheapest house was bought in a regional town of New South Wales, okay, New South Wales is a state in Australia, where it was initially listed for $80,000, and I'm not going to give you the full version of the story, but I was chasing this deal for around a year, touching base with the listing agent, and then the the, the seller was going through insurance uh, issues because the property got vandalized once, twice, three times it got vandalized, and he was chasing the insurance and whatnot, and then just one day, I called the listing agent. I said, listen, darling, I'm not willing to wait one single day. I will buy this property right now in the current condition for $15,000 cash. Take it or leave it, love, or I'm walking. She calls me back an hour later saying, you've got a deal. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. So I, <laughs> I put 15000 into it and I sold it for $84,500. Now, please keep in mind, Jay, this is like buying an apartment in Manhattan for 100000 bucks. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen. It's impossible. And um, yeah, I mean, the media picked up on it and, and um, you know, I had quite a few interviews about it. And um, if you Google it, I think it's still known as Australia's cheapest house to this day. So there you go. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, it just underscores 
one of the things that I, I, I've said many times, that an offer is just an invitation for a conversation. And you don't know. You, I, I get it all the time. People are like, well, I can't offer that because they won't accept it. You have no clue until you put it out there. You got to put it out there to find out will they accept it or not. And there's nothing wrong with something totally ridiculous that surprises you. It's just that when they say yes, move quickly, because I I know you were thinking there's no way. I mean, come on. Were you actually thinking they were going to say yes? Uh, No, of course not. (laughs) But what you just said, uh, mate, you and I are too much alike. We've got to catch up for coffee one day. (laughs) I've got a saying. I've got a saying, Jay. The more mud you throw on the wall, eventually some will stick. Okay, have thick skin, submit low ball offers all day, every day, be professional. Once again, do not react, always respond. Okay, if someone argues with you about your offer, just say, hey, this was my perception of the property's worth. I'm so sorry if I offended you now. I can get away with murder with an Australian accent here in the US, but let's just say you don't have an Australian (laughs) accent, right? And eventually, eventually, I, I offer on 20 properties a day, Jay. And guess what? Every single one of them gets rejected. But I do it every single day, right? I do it every single day, seven days a week. And out of 100 of, let's say, 100 properties are selling for $10, and I will offer $3 on 100 properties, 99 times out of 100, the seller comes back and he abuses me and he screams at me and whatnot. And I'm very professional. I've got thick skin. You know, I I manage to defuse the situation. But that once, Jay, that once they come back and they say, you know what? I really need to sell $6 $6 and it's yours. And I know that I've got that property for five bucks. And I also know that it's worth at least 12 once I fix it up. Right. Okay. So that's, that's, you know, low ball negotiation. I love it. I've, I've, I've actually got a guide that I've written about it. Um, and yeah, mate, love it. Love your style, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we're, we're kindred spirit for, for very similar reasons. Like I said, we, we had the same amount of resources, none, when we got started. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so therefore we had to develop uh, on the street, you know, you, you, there's no other way. We had no other way in. And that, but that's also one of the greatest things about real estate. It, there's no pretension. You can, anybody can play, but you know, everyone is welcome to play. And depending on your ability to develop, as you call it, thick skin and the, de- uh, the de- stick to itiveness and de- discipline and respect and all these things, uh, you, you're, you're able to go out there and make it happen. So today, Tell us a little bit uh, about, you know, what you guys are out there doing. Now, first of all, let me say I absolutely love the Midwest for cash flow because that's where Illinois was actually the, the state that I first did most of my yep. single family houses in because it's it's very, very similar. Um, and, but at the end of the day, I, I would love to know because I'm sure someone is wondering, okay, he's from Australia and he played soccer in Europe. <laughs> Why Ohio? <laughs> well, mate, well, there you go. Hey, we'll check this out. Um, a lot of people follow each other like white sheep, right? And I was always the black sheep. I would always go where no one else wanted to go. Yep. And, you know, that's another that's another thing that makes the difference, mate. Success comes from doing things differently. I told you I was going to be full of quotes for you today. <laughs> um, but, mate, yeah, Ohio. Well, check this out, Jay. You know, Mr. Wall Street has not waved his magic wand, raised $2 billion, and come into the Ohio market and bought every single property that was available. They've done that in Georgia. They've done that in Florida. They've done that in North Carolina. They've done that in Texas. They're starting to do it in Kansas and Missouri. Now, don't get me wrong. There's still good deals in all of those markets, but they're not as sexy as they are here in Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. I mean, we're talking about no competition at all whatsoever, right? The mom and dad investors are all caught up with the media pumping high unemployment and declining population. Jesus, Jay, I feel like a kid in a candy store. There's pockets here in town where our phones are blowing up every single day, people wanting to rent because they're within close proximity to good schools or a university. I mean, don't believe everything you hear on the TV or you read in the papers. You have to, well, I'm going back now. You have to establish the trust and relationship with key people on the ground in the particular area of interest because those folks live and breathe the market. They know what works and they know what doesn't work. And they can guide you throughout all of the BS that you hear on TV and in the media. And, mate, yeah, Ohio is is just – I don't want it to sound biased, but it's a great market. And, look, I'm a Sydney boy, right? I love the beach. I love the hot weather, mate. I wouldn't be here right now if the numbers didn't work and if there wasn't that much opportunity, mate. Trust me, I would rather be back home in Australia. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I Well – 
I hear you completely. This is one of the reasons I stay in California is because I don't have to have a change of I don't have to have winter set of clothing <laughs> at, at all. I mean, and, you know, once we begin to hit 60 degrees, I'm like, oh, it's cold. And, and not really, because when I call home to North Carolina, my mom really reminds me what cold really is uh, at the yep. end of the day. However, you you hit on this, the, the premises. One of the things that I love, too, is you go where they ain't. Period. So if everybody's doing one thing, you go do the opposite. And if the opposite is Ohio, then Ohio, baby, here we come. Because that's exactly what makes sense. I mean, that was one of the reasons why Illinois and the certain parkets made sense. And obviously, we're not talking about the Chicago metro area because, again, you can still have, you know, property or pricing issues. That doesn't mean there aren't deals there. It just means there's lower hanging fruit in many tertiary markets that you may not have considered. And yet, if you can find the right individuals on the ground to make things happen, I think that's perfect in so many ways. So at, at so there's there's also got to be a transition, though. I mean, you're coming from... Australia. And I, I know you guys use, uh, I think the term is gearing <laughs> in a very different way than what yep. we use here. And there's so many things that you've got to learn because you've learned real estate. Yes. You've learned business. Yes. But there's a different translation of language and how that's done. Tell me a little bit about what you've noticed to be significantly different between the two the two countries and, and transacting business in both places. Oh wow mate that's funny. Well well we say good day mate and you guys say sup man. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's and then, true. And then what we've got that we've got veranda, you guys have porch, we've right. got lollies, you guys have candy. Now that aside mate, look uh, Jay, it's a completely different world. Okay. Australia's got a population of twenty two million people. The US has three hundred and thirty million. Okay. Don't quote me on those figures. Um but um uh, I mean, those are probably, uh, you know, besides the actual lingo and whatnot, I mean, everything's different here from, from the con- materials in construction to, you know, the title companies. In Australia, we don't have title companies. In Australia, we've got closing solicitors or settlement solicitors, as we like to call them there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, here you've got um, asphalt roofs. Over there, we've got, you know, uh, tile roofs. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of the things with the construction materials and the lingo, um, you know, the rent over there is paid weekly. Here it's paid monthly. I mean, it is just a completely different world. Here, uh, in the smaller cities, the closer you are to downtown, the worse the area is in Australia, you're looking at, you know, $10 million for an apartment, similar to New York, Chicago, LA, you know, these bigger hubs. Um, then, for instance, in Australia, you know, if, you, if you're looking at buying a higher cash flowing property and they're only at 6 or 7%, you've got to drive bloody two hours out of uh, downtown, okay? And we call it over there the central business district. So, yeah, mate, look, it's a complete different world. It took me a lot of time to adjust. But, you know, when I moved to the country, I made my whole life evolve around real estate. I lived it. I breathed it. I loved it every single day. And then you eventually pick up, mate. You pick up things if you want to pick them up. If if you're sitting in a classroom, mate, like you and I were, you know, a long time ago, and, and we were thinking about playing soccer or whatever, we were thinking, of course, you're not going to listen to the teacher, right? But if your focus is on on, on that whiteboard or, or on picking up the different terminologies used here compared to Australia, you'll pick it up and you'll love it and you'll own it, baby. Yeah, I agreed, agreed. One of the things that I uh, have often told in many individuals is that by learning real estate, you it gives you entry points so that you could literally go to any country and actually find a way to do business so long as you have two things, the legal right to own property and you've got people to deal with. If you've got those two things, once you learn it one place, you can go do it pretty much anywhere. Now, you had the additional challenge of having to learn English because we, as you mentioned earlier, we we don't use the same words. There's always that that translation. But outside of that, I'm guessing the fundamentals are pretty much the same, even though the language is slightly different. 100%, Jay. At the end of the day, you know, as I stressed earlier, it all comes down to the people. And no matter what it is that you're doing, mate, and, and you're right, in any, in, in, in any country, okay, in any country, as long as you have the right people around you that you can trust, okay, that have those four traits, let's revise them again, loyalty, honesty, no greed, and respect, I mean, you can make money. You can make money, have the right people on the ground. Eventually, as you as you grow as an investor, as a 
and an entrepreneur, you will start to pick up things. You will start to, you know, educate yourself. You'll start to learn more. You will start to gain more experience. And then the same fundamentals, as you said, can be implied everywhere. And at the end of the day, mate, why do we all invest in real estate? Okay, we invest to get cash flow. We invest to supplement the current jobs that we're working in, that we don't want to be working in. Or guess what, mate? Even if we love working in the current job, well, it's still also making an extra hundred grand a year from rent before you get out of bed, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you can make money in, in any market as long as you have the right people around you and um, you have a general understanding of the fundamentals, as you mentioned. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, for those that are listening and going, you know what? I maybe I hadn't considered Ohio. Maybe, you know, this 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 guy actually has something going on. If they wanted to find out more information, what's their logical uh next step? Quite easy, mate. Thanks for asking. Well, look, if they just jump on Google and they type in Ohio cash flow, click enter, and we pretty much pop up on the first page. Or alternatively, mate, if they type in my name, Angelo Rumora, let me spell that out. E N G E L O. Okay, R U M O R A. Um, I pretty much my pretty face pops up everywhere on Google today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's an Australian habit uh, right there to 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 refer to yourself as the pretty face, but that's fine. Uh, we 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 agree. We agree. Now, I have a question for you. Sure. There's many individuals who are. Maybe they're thinking about putting on, you know, their superhero outfit for the first time. They're they're ready to to go out there and start saving lives in, in in their own way with their own business and building cash flow in some way, shape, or form. What would you say to that person who's considering putting on the cape for the first time, or the person who's wondering, is it time for me to turn in the cape because they've just experienced so many hard roads and so many setbacks in front of them? Jay, you ready for one final quote? <laughs> yeah, go for it. All right, listen to this one. Transform fear into prudence, pain into transformation, mistakes into initiation, and desire into undertaking. Wow. All right. How about that? <laughs> you, 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 did you, did you have a whole list of them written out? You were you just waiting for me here today. Mate, <laughs> my office resembles a scene from the beautiful mind by Russell Crowe. Seriously. I've got papers everywhere around me. All right. <laughs> got it. Got it. Totally understood. Understood. But there's so much to be learned from other people. We can't live long enough to learn it all ourselves or make all those mistakes. So I'm, I'm guessing you've, you've read a book or two. A few. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you, you constantly read books and, and they're constantly still improving because uh, I know there can be this thought process that once you've gotten or achieved a certain level of success that you stop, what would you say to that? Never stop. Never stop. There is always something that uh, you can do. There's, there is always someone that you can help. One of my uh, uh, goals is I've got a financial figure right now, Jay, that I'm chasing. Well, guess what, baby? As soon as I hit that financial figure, it's going to change. I will not be chasing dollars anymore. I'm going to be chasing how many people I can help. And then I'm going to replace my purpose, okay, or my, my financial targets with a different purpose. So I'm just going to shift it a little bit. I'm just going to change it a little bit. And then it's just going to come down to how many people I can help. And that's no BS, mate. That is definitely no BS. And that's, the, that's what I truly feel from within. And I don't care if folks don't believe it. I know it might sound corny. Oh, yeah, I'm going to save the world. But, you know, that is what I genuinely believe from deep inside my heart. And does, you know what, mate? You don't need to be a billionaire. You don't even need to be a hundred millionaire. I mean, there's a, there's a number where, where it's more than sufficient if invested well for you, your family, your loved ones, and generations to come. And there's so many people out there, mate, that need help. Um, and um, I mean, that I think that's why we're on this planet, to be honest with you. Um, once, once you help yourself, I mean, go help as many people as you can. And and awesome stuff that you're doing with these interviews, mate, because I know that you're helping a lot of people um, for sure. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you were willing to come and speak with us today because this indeed uh, Cashflow Diary was born out of a desire to help other people begin their journeys, continue their journeys, persevere through their journeys so that they too can become bigger, better, better investors and do the things that provide jobs as well as good quality housing. So. I just want to say thanks for investing the time here with us today, Angelo. Jay, thanks for having me, mate. It was an absolute pleasure. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? You know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means go over to ohiogashflow.com because you probably might learn a thing or two as it relates to why Ohio and why cash flow and how is all that going to work? You never know what you might be able to find just by listening to the next episode. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.